Greetings from Tokyo, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very, very much hope that this video finds you well and in very, very good spirits wherever you are in the world. And today, if you don't mind, I would very much like to continue on with our journey, our discussions, our discoveries, and our explorations with respect to the recent releases made by the Criterion Collection during this year of 2023. And specifically, I'd like to speak about a film which is included in this great set, this 4K UHD plus Blu-ray combo set, which is a re-release of a set which already exists in the Criterion Collection, uh, the set at spine number 587, and it is this set, which is uh, blue, white, red, three colors by Krzysztof Kislowski. And today I'd like to speak about one film in this collection. This film, as part of the set, is given its own spine number as well, uh, at spine number 588, and it is a film from the year 1993. And it is from the filmmaker, the director, uh, Krzysztof Kislowski. And the name of the film is... Blue. This is the work from the year 1993, and it is from the screenplay by Stav Pisevich and Stav Kislovsky, and it is directed by uh, uh, Stav Kislovsky, and the producer is Marin Karmitz, and the music is by Zbigniew Preisner, and uh, the cinematography is Slavomir Ijak. And among its really brilliant cast, we have Juliette Benoche and Benoit Réjean, and others. Uh, Juliette Benoche portrays the main character here, oh Julie, uh, in this uh, incredible, uh, incredible work, uh, which is part of the Three Colors, Trois Couleurs, and it is the film, again from 1993, which is Bleu, Blue. So much to say about this film, Blue. Uh, what a magnificent film this is, I think, capped off by so many elements, both visual and emotional, and among those incredible arresting and powerful elements, we have, of course, the the tour de force performance by Juliette Bonoche as Julie, our main character, and uh, it is her character, it is she uh, that we, the viewers, uh, are engaging with, and whose story we follow, and the episodes and scenarios of her life uh, that is the subject of, or that are the subject of this uh, incredible work of art, Bleu, uh, from uh, Kislovsky. If we were to try, I think, to focus on the story or plot structure of the film Bleu, again, we were focusing on this main character, the Juliette Binoche character of Julie, and almost immediately, uh, in the film's opening moments, we understand that uh, she has a family, uh, she has a husband and a child, but uh, again, almost immediately too, in the opening moments, we understand too that her family has undergone a sudden and very horrific and quite tragic uh, accident. And as a result of that, unfortunately, uh, only she has survived. Uh, the other members of her family have unfortunately uh, died. So she is surviving a very sudden and tragic accident. So we see her again in these opening moments of the film uh, trying to recover and recuperate physically. But we also see, again extended from the opening of the film and then continuing on throughout the film, we see what one might call, again what one might call depending on how one interprets this film, a means by which our character of Julie is attempting to find solace or deal with the grief or the emotional impact uh, that this set of events has uh, presented, while also providing or perhaps uh, giving us uh, the opportunity to interpret this film in an equal yet alternative way, which is perhaps uh, her quote-unquote road to dealing with the grief and loss might also be intertwined or intercut or perhaps even uh, contradicting uh, her uh, arguably other journey or one of the other journeys of her life in this film, namely the idea of liberation or freedom or uh, liberté 
uh, in a kind of broadly, I think, uh, interpreted sense of that phrase or that notion. Um, before I go, go on, let me say that the concept of three colors has been well documented uh, in the uh, criticisms, in the reviews, and including the criterion supplements, which we will talk a little bit about later on in this video discussion. Uh, but what we have in the concept, intertwined uh, in the concept of the three colors, of course, is the notion of the French flag and the colors of the French flag, blue, white, and red. Blue representing the idea of uh, uh, liberté, la liberté, or liberty. And so the idea, therefore, being is that through some, say, conscious or subconscious notion of what uh, we as viewers might take liberty to mean, and also how we might look at the film and see how certain aspects of the film might ring true in terms of a discussion of liberty, again, depending on how we view the film. Uh, one can then take this notion of liberty, uh, again, broadly construed, I admit, we can take this notion of liberty and perhaps try to apply it in some way to the journey of Julie. Um, uh, I should try to be careful here because I, I don't, uh, I, I think it's a very, actually, it's, it's quite a complex uh, way of it, engaging with the interpretation of this and the other films in the trilogy, in fact. Uh, but just to take this step, let me say that it is very possible, I think, to look at Julie's journey as a means by which she is perhaps engaging in a sense of liberty, but liberty uh, in the context of her emotional, say, grief. Uh, and to put it in even more, I think, direct terms, one can say that Julie's journey is a very peculiar one because she seems to be uh, somewhat set off or she seems to be uh, somewhat isolated emotionally. There are moments where she seems, in terms of an exterior, quite cold and quite unfeeling, again, from an exterior uh, perspective point of view. And in fact, there are some moments throughout the film where people comment about how she doesn't seem to be expressing any type of emotional response or reaction, uh, especially considering uh, the suddenness and the tragedy and the great... A uh, great uh, degree, the high degree of uh, personal uh, sacrifice and personal effect uh, that the events of the start of the film have would have um, uh, from a, a sort of societal uh, perspective, uh, broadly speaking, but also I intimately and personally speaking, of course, because it's a very tragic thing that has happened to her. But despite the degree of tragedy, she doesn't seem to be, at least on the outward surface, responding in a way that one might associate in terms of, of an, an emotional response. Now, I wouldn't call that necessarily unnatural. I would call that very personalized and very personal to Julie's journey. Uh, but one could therefore uh, perhaps try to interpret this as a, a viewer in the external universe, uh, externally watching the character of Julie. One can interpret this quote-unquote lack of emotional response as being perhaps maybe and to apply the the concept of liberty in this way uh, a means by which maybe Julie is trying to deal with the intensity of the pain of the emotional grief by uh, not feeling by not responding by not uh, reacting thus freeing herself from the bounds or the quote-unquote the the, uh, the, the connections uh, to these emotional, say, heartbeats, freeing herself from these emotional connections, thus freeing herself from the potential pain and from the potential emotional grief uh, that uh, she would uh, otherwise uh, be reasonably expected to feel. Uh, had she, uh, were she, were she to continue on with these uh, connections. And so there's this idea, therefore, that if we were to apply the concept of liberty in the context of Julie's, say, uh, emotional journey throughout the film, and indeed a character journey and plot journey throughout the film, Blue, one can interpret perhaps her journey as an attempt or an endeavor on her part to free herself, uh, uh, the application of liberté in this context, uh, to free herself from... Uh, the bounds of, say, an emotional connection, thus being a means by which uh, one deals with the sudden loss and tragedy that yields an emotional grief. So that's one way, I think, of 
of uh, positing uh, the application of liberty uh, in in this film Blue. But I I want to I want to suggest, however, that uh, it is a very complex and nuanced uh, terrain. That is the human heart and the human soul and the spirit and the actual uh, the the grains and the 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 contours and the 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 rocks and the sand that one can call the contours of the terrain of of human experience, and that's my way also to suggest that uh, you know human beings and the the human heart is a very complex. Uh, thing indeed, beautifully complex indeed, and that is certainly the case. One can say for the characters of the world of Pisivich and Kislovsky, uh, among whom is of course the the great, uh, uh, the great character, the the greatly memorable character of Julie, portrayed by Juliette Binoche in a tour de force performance. And so uh, we can see the various episodes of her life. And we see the various episodes of the people that she meets, and we see her relocating, moving, uh, dealing with objects of the past, objects that belonged to uh, the people that were part of her family but are now uh, passed away. And we see her dealing with that almost in a confrontational or maybe even uh, sudden grief-stricken or uh, almost harshly violent and, and physically overwhelming way. Uh, thus almost applying a sense of extremity to her experience, almost trying to uh, stimulate herself uh, uh, out of a state which is uh, which could otherwise be described as being either lulled or numb, or perhaps uh, there is something more going on here. And uh, what do I mean by this? So we do see uh, scenarios or instances where she is uh, maybe experiencing some kind of physical pain. Uh, she is experiencing some kind of discussion or interaction with another character, Olivier as being a, a, a prime example. Uh, we see her trying to engage with certain components and aspects of who she thought her husband was, but perhaps she's learning some new things or different things that she didn't, uh, she was not privy to prior to uh, what happened at the start of the film. And this has to do with, uh, uh, this has to do uh, with a number of things, uh, one of which being perhaps uh, the state of music and uh, his role and position as a composer and a very famous modern uh, classical composer. Which is uh, then uh, interweaving or the opportunity for the filmmakers uh, uh, Kislovsky and the composer Preisner to interweave and intercut aspects of the film score and the dynamics of the music, which are absolutely stunning and uh, utterly enchanting and mesmerizing. You know, one of the great strengths of these works by Kislovsky. Uh, including Blue, including the other films in the trilogy, uh, one of the great strengths is the music. And so uh, here we have the way in which music inter interweaves and, inter and overlaps and uh, intercuts uh, because it is a direct reference to the plot of the film and the characters of uh, uh, Julie uh, and others uh, because they are dealing with the world of music. Uh, and music seems, therefore, to be a haunting uh, element. It seems almost ghostly or uh, like a specter because it seems to int intrude and inter interrupt uh, the life of Julie when one can say that she's in a state of being uh, in a in sort of an emotionally numbed state. And music seems to interrupt or invade that space almost to, to violently uh, awaken her out of that state of numbness and to remind her of something, uh, whatever that something might be, we can interpret. It could be a sense of an awakening into some kind of a, a realization of emotional grief, a reminder of the past, perhaps also a calling to the future, because also part of the plot of the film Blue is the idea of writing and composition of music. Will this or will this, will, will it succeed or won't it? Um, and also how the composition and arrangement and understanding of music, how it seems to then perhaps lay the groundwork for the ability for her, Julie, to interact with uh, the outside world, including Olivia, including uh, various observations that she might make of the outside world, say, sitting in a cafe, uh, drinking coffee, eating ice cream, looking into the outside, listening to music, or perhaps uh, being by herself alone in a swimming pool, and then suddenly recalling something. Uh, and does she invite that suddenness or does she resist uh, the urge or temptation uh, and does she try then to further isolate herself? Uh, and these become part of the ebb and flow, the push and pull of the 
emotional journey or the 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 emotional or non-emotional journey i use quotes again depending on one's point of view of julie throughout the film and so that's how music i think is interwoven both in terms of a sonic cue as well as a very detailed plot point and also a means by which uh, uh, uh kislovsky and preisner and others are really trying to engage with us on a visual and oral uh, experience uh, again, uh, music is uh, in this wonderful paradoxical way, uh, both uh, shining a light on the uh, potential of the uh, the outgrowth of the journey of emotional grief, but also a uh, means by which Julie might be uh, hesitant to let that in or perhaps trying to cut herself off. Thus, music becomes uh, paradoxically both a, an invitation to liberty but also a rejection of liberty in that way. So uh, it's uh, it, it, that's an example, I think, of how wonderfully uh, complex and rich uh, the cinema landscape of Blue really is. And again, always at the heart, of cent- at heart and center of it is uh, the human character, the human dynamic, with Julie uh, being uh, the, one of the prime examples of this. Um, and so... Uh, what I also want to suggest in this film when one watches it is that there are, I think, very inexplicable matters that also occur because uh, with this push and pull, this ebb and flow of of moments and scenes that seem very uh, particular and direct and very much part of, say, the human experience of the everyday, uh, they have this uh, tendency or they have this wonderful ability of, of becoming both everyday and mundane and then also very much poetically uh, extraordinary at the same time. And so uh, therein lies, I think, a wonderful way in which this film uh, continues on with the uh, the cinematic contradictory paradox, which I think is at the very heart and center of uh, the, wor- the works of uh, Kieslowski and uh, with Blue in particular. And I think that also is a great reflection a parallelism with the, the ebb and flow, the push and pull, the sort of uh, the mundane everyday versus the transcendental, uh, almost cosmic, uh, in terms of the journey of Julie, uh, does she try to uh, attempt to uh, constrain herself to the detail of the mundane to try to resist, say, the urge of feeling an emotional grief, or does she uh, does she uh, take the view? of a type of almost uh, cosmic understanding and acceptance of uh, connection, uh, thus, I think, creating even more paradox in terms of how one applies liberty, because after all, if one uh, takes the notion of the cosmic and almost the uh, the, the universal and uh, transcendentalism, one can think of almost the infinite. And if one thinks of the infinite, one perhaps naturally associates the idea of the cosmic and infinite with uh, liberty and freedom. Uh, because of the expansiveness of uh, one's concept of uh, of the cosmic and infinite. But in fact, uh, one can say that uh, joining the connection with the emotional experience uh, of the cosmic and infinite is indeed a contradiction of the liberty that uh, one can say uh, Julie is trying to establish by indeed cutting herself off from uh, this type of emotional experience, thus cutting herself off from uh, the beauty and, and uh, tragic dynamic of uh, the experience of, of the infinite in that way. So uh, that, again, uh, is another way in my own very crude and shallow and uh, very very poorly constructed uh, word expression way to try to suggest that indeed yes there are so many hidden latent and quite also quite evident uh, contradictions within this one reads uh, into this film uh, but the more one reads into the film I think the more one realizes that there are many crossroads of reading and much like uh, Kislovsky's other films, you know, one can take one road, turn left, and it takes us into a one possibility of life and reading of the film, or we can turn right, and we can then uh, have a different existence, uh, a double life, a double vie, uh, as a matter of speaking, in terms of how one reads the film Bleu, uh, and we can understand that everything uh, is at once a contradiction, and everything is at once a type of paradox, and everything is at once almost uh, paralleled to each other, and perhaps even colliding and cl- uh, clashing with each other, but always, always, always uh, being true to the nature of the, the human uh, uh, endeavor and the human experience. Again, ex- uh, exemplified and personified in the character of uh, the films of Blue, specifically and perhaps primarily the character of Julie by uh, Juliette Binoche. So uh, that also, I think, uh, in terms of the application of, say, possibilities of interpretation, uh, I think that also applies to the concept of blue itself, the 
the color of blue because one can say that as a visual motif blue is very much a film that is about blue the color blue there are moments where colors are very very strikingly apparent the way that certain crystals or 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 uh, uh, um, ornaments have a blue color which is further i think um, intensified by the the uh, refraction of light etc or maybe the the reflection of a blue wrapper or the uh, reflection or the capturing of light uh, as it hits in a pool uh, where Julie is swimming alone or the way that blue is reflected in the sky uh, of the uh, the evening uh, or the way in which we have the light, the, the street light somehow uh, glittering off the cars and the, the pavement and the asphalt, etc., that really maybe gives this blue hue or neon glow, etc. Blue is not the only color that operates in the universe of the film blue. There are many other colors in, colors in the palette, of course, but uh, it is called blue, and there is this, of course, I think very natural uh, tendency and inclination uh, on, the, on my part and indeed on the part of many other uh, viewers, much more uh, uh, naturally observant and astute than I, who take the concept of, and the color of blue and really can uh, run with it in terms of possible interpretation of uh, interpretations of how uh, blue operates. I, I think, uh, much like the notion of music, much like the notion of liberté, and much like the notion of say uh, uh, um, grief and f and liberté, I think the concept of blue can also be interpreted uh, in a wide variety of possibilities. Um, it, it might be a type of reminder of the everyday mundane, because after all, blue exists in the natural world. And it is a very, I think, common occurrence to see the color blue in many parts of our life. So perhaps in that way, it is a very everyday thing. At the same time, it is given effect of being almost uh, otherworldly or it's uh, it's so, it's focused on with such a an intensity of uh, the cinematic uh, camera work by uh, Ijak and uh, Kislovsky and others here such that uh, it's uh, the the intense focus and scrutiny that some everyday object is given with the color blue for example uh, the intensity of the focus, of such focus, gives rise to the possibility uh, transcending something to the ethereal and, and uh, universal and cosmic, etc. Uh, so uh, that is, again, uh, another example of how this film operates on this really wonderfully and strangely hypnotic quality of being many things at once. And I think the concept and the phrase being many things at once uh, one can say cinematically metaphysical. Uh, one can say also very much a part of the Kislovsky cinema philosophical uh, approach and, and aesthetic. Everything at once, or many people at once, or many consciousness, uh, many degrees of consciousness at once, many states of being at once. And uh, this is also, uh, I think, a wonderful way in which one can see not just uh, the potential of, say, a type of um, metaphysics, but also the way in which, going back to the human spirit, how we wonder, how we perceive ourselves, and how we think about what is or what could have been, or what is and what is not. And I think those questions and others, I think, are the very heart of what Julie, uh, the Juliette Binoche character, might be said to be uh, engaging with or, or undergoing or perhaps resisting or perhaps not trying not to answer uh, while she is uh, going through the journey that she is, while she is meeting and engaging with the people that she meets along the way, that we too meet along the way in this fascinating journey of uh, this individual this person who is, again, uh, this tour de force performance by uh, Juliette Binoche. It's a really, uh, it, it, a really incredible performance. She really puts everything uh, into this performance. There are moments of f real physical pain, even, uh, that uh, she feels and that uh, we therefore feel. And it's done, we understand from the supplements, uh, it was, uh, these are choices that she made. Uh, in terms of going through the extreme nature of uh, some of the choices that are part of that performance, it is it is truly uh, uh, it it's it is truly th and thoroughly 
uh, engaging uh, and uh, very uh, human and very much part of feeling and non-feeling. I mean, that's another thing, too, that's really, I think, fascinating about this and I'm sure must be incredibly difficult uh, in terms of pulling off in terms of uh, an acting performance is trying to capture the sense of being and non-being, trying to capture a sense of, of is and is not. And that contradiction, uh, whether it's reflected in the subtlety of a curl of a smile, or maybe it's not even a smile, maybe there's a glance that is meant to uh, suggest something, but also suggest nothing at the same time, maybe the reflection of the eye, the eye is the window to the soul, but also it's a block off from the soul, so what we see reflected in the eye uh, may or may not be penetrating the soul of Julie, who knows? So these sorts of contradictions are part of the staggering detail of uh, Binoche's performance here, and I think uh, that is, uh, again, a testament to the great strength and great skill that she and others uh, are exhibiting when they are performing here in Blue and then indeed in the other films of the three, three Colors, which we'll talk a little bit about in later videos. Uh, and then also we have to say the great cinematography by Ijak uh, and the great collaboration between Ijak and Kislovsky here and the great collaboration between Kislovsky and Preisner in terms of the music, the collaboration between Kislovsky and Pisevich in terms of the story and the concepts and the moral quandaries uh, and the possibilities here. And indeed too, I should say there is a way in which this film is uh, engaging in so many levels of potential interpretation. I've spoken only about uh, just a, a very short amount of what is potentially almost a wealth, an infinite wealth of interpretation. Let me point out, too, the potential of the social-political uh, undercurrent. This is, of course, the early 90s, and this is uh, in the, uh, in the uh, ensuing years immediately after the fall of the Berlin Wall and uh, the end of the Soviet Union. And so uh, we have the state of Europe uh, during the early 90s, and thus uh, leads, gives rise to a concept or leitmotif uh, that's expressed also musically um, uh, in terms of uh, what's referred to as the unification of Europe. And this idea, too, of unification, this idea of connection, this idea of some kind of, of, of group standing dynamic as a means of establishing a type of diplomatic and geopolitical identity on a, uh, on a co sort of continental basis, uh, a la uh, the European Union. Uh, this, I think, has, of course, uh, uh, socio geopolitical and, and sociopolitical uh, underpinnings, of course, but it also goes back to the very intimate and personal, namely the idea of unity, the, the idea of union and connection, whether that is indeed possible. Does that idea of unity give rise to a sense of liberty that we were speaking about for? If so, does that not contradict what we were trying to discuss earlier, which is liberty in the context of Julie's story is a cutting off of connection rather than an establishment of connection? So it is the very opposite of unity or unification, or is it? Uh, so these and other questions, I think, are at the very heart and soul of Blue, both in terms of a, a broad geopolitical context and also on the close-knit, intimate personal, highly, highly personal, almost so personal to be almost uh, uh, so personal to be uh, totally and utterly unknown uh, to everyone except uh, the ultimate subjective experience, that is the experience of Julie herself. Uh, do we know who she is by the end of the film? Are we privy to her journey? Maybe, maybe not, but maybe. Yes, maybe, because, again, this film is many things at, at once. It is a source of answers. It is also a source of unanswered questions. It is a means by which we understand and not understand. It's also we, we feel and not feel, and also we are and we are not. Uh, but that uh, understanding and acknowledgement of, of various contradictions and paradoxes and, indeed, uh, things and ideas that may or may not always go together at once simultaneously, but maybe they do. Uh, and that's part of the magic, and that's part of the grace, and that's part of the beauty and cinema philosophy and aesthetic uh, of uh, the world of Kieslowski, again, as embodied in this magnificent, magnificent film, Blue. 
the Criterion Collection has released this film, Blue, as part of its new re-release of the set this year, uh, this time on the 4K UHD plus Blu-ray combo edition, a re-release of the set, Blue, White, Red, Three Colors by Stolf Kislovsky. So one of the films being, of course, Blue. Um, I'll speak a little bit more about the presentation and also the packaging uh, in a separate video discussion, but let me just say very briefly that Blue is part of the discussion. Excuse me, the, the films are out of order here. I apologize, but... Um, uh, the the film blue comes its, with its own sleeve, and the sleeve goes in like this as part of the uh, other film collection. So you take the sleeve out, and it has its own little individual sleeve uh, in this digipack format. And then you open it, and you can see the two discs housed uh, in this way. Part, I apologize for the glare here, but uh, you see the two discs housed. Uh, one for the Blu-ray disc and the other for the 4K UHD. And there is also a separate booklet, which we will also talk about in a later video. And this separate booklet has, among other things, some details about the film Blue specifically, cast and crew details, etc. So um, this is purported to be based on a new 4K digital restoration. Uh, 4K digital restoration with 5.1 surround DTS HD master audio soundtrack and the 4K UHD disc is uh, presented in Dolby Vision HDR and then uh, we have so we have the two discs the 4K UHD disc and then the Blu-ray disc again you can see the two discs housed in this uh, digipack uh, housing uh, mechanism compartment on this side of the the flap uh, or the, the, the individual packaging. I'll speak more about the presentation and my comments about the presentation uh, in a separate video discussion about the 4K digital restorations here. I think there's, there's some comments that I think uh, are worth making uh, with that, and I'll speak about that later, again, in the context of the trilogy. And I'll speak uh, about some details of the packaging as well uh, and the cover art a little bit in, uh, in the separate video discussion as well. So let me save those comments for another time. In the meantime, also let me say that the film is available on either disc, the four or both discs, respectively. So you can watch the film in the 4K UHD disc. You can watch the same film on the Blu-ray disc as well. But in addition, uh, we have on the Blu-ray disc supplements that can be found as well. So the supplements themselves won't be found on the 4K UHD disc, but you can find them on the Blu-ray disc. So. Uh, I should point out before I go into the specifics here uh, what the supplements are. Each film in the set, uh, blue, white, red, has its own discs like this, the 4K UHD plus the Blu-ray disc. And so you can have uh, each film on its own separate disc with its own separate compartment and sleeve, etc. And then thus on each of the film's Blu-ray disc release, you also have the option of going to the supplements. So blue has its own supplements, white has its own supplements, red has its own supplements. But I should be very careful in that discussion because, or that description, because when I say, for example, blue has its own supplements, what I want to suggest, however, is that the, the disc of blue has included with it its a set of supplements. The disc of red has included with it its set of supplements. The disc of white has included with it a set of supplements. I should have said blue, white, and red instead of blue, red, white, excuse me, but uh, you know what I mean, right? So uh, they have their own set of supplements. It can be said that the supplements that are accompanying that particular film could, generally speaking, be tied to that particular film. For example, the supplements that I'm about to discuss regarding blue or included in the Blu-ray disc of Blue could be said to be tied directly to the film Blue. And in some instances, in some respects, they, they are. However, 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 my strong, strong suggestion is watch all of the films first. In other words, watch Blue, watch White, and then watch Red first. And then, after you've seen the films, all the films, Go back and you can watch the supplements, starting with the supplements on the blue disc. And the reason why I say that is that um, while it can be said that some of the supplements found on the blue disc are associated specifically with blue, and in some respects they are, it is also the case that the supplements do talk, I think, about the trilogy writ large. They talk about each of the films other than blue as well. And so there are dis occasions where you're watching a supplement on the blue disc, and then you can see discussions referring to white or referring to red as an example, and then talking about the trilogy as a whole. And I think, therefore, watching blue but not watching white or red 
uh, might lead to maybe being spoiled, uh, some spoiler information. So if you watch, if you haven't watched White or Red yet, you might be watching the blue supplements and then uh, getting some information revealed to you that uh, you might want to hold off on until you actually see the films. You know what I mean? So my strong, strong suggestion, therefore, is to watch the films first, blue, white, and red. And then after you've done so, you can go and watch the supplements, starting with the supplements on blue, because they do touch upon not just blue, but also the other uh, films in the trilogy. And that holds true, I think, for the supplements found on the white Blu-ray disc, and then the supplements found on the red Blu-ray disc. So that's my strong, strong su suggestion. So I will try in this discussion of the su supplements to be as very vague as possible, so I don't want to uh, go into too much of a discussion of the other films, because we haven't spoken about those yet. But uh, just uh, please keep in mind uh, that is my strong suggestion is perhaps watch the films first and then go into the supplements for blue. Uh, but with that out of the way, uh, with that uh, uh, mentioned, let me now talk about what you can find on the Blu-ray disc in terms of the supplements included with blue. So uh, I should also point out that the supplements that you can find on this 4K UHD plus Blu-ray release, the Blu-ray disc of blue, you can also find um, the supplements, the same supplements that were found on the earlier uh, release from around 2011. So it, it's my understanding that the same supplements that you found on the earlier release from 10 years ago, the Blu-ray release from over 10 years ago, those are the same supplements you can find now included in this re-release of the film uh, on the occasion of this year, 2023. So we're getting that continuity. Uh, I don't see anything new uh, in terms of uh, anything added f for the occasion of 2023. So uh, we're getting the same uh, supplements, uh, nothing new as far as I understand. But that is in no way any type of detriment, uh, uh, especially for people who have not yet seen these supplements because uh, the supplements w uh, were great in 2011 and they still are great in 2023. So that, let me put it that way. So uh, first up we have On Blue, which is a type of uh, visual or video essay discussion with film professor and expert and uh, uh, Kislovsky expert uh, Annette Insdorf. This is again from 2011, approximately 20 minutes. This is absolutely brilliant. If you haven't seen uh, Professor Insdorf's discussion here, you have to check it. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. She discusses this uh, film. She's so knowledgeable. She uh, discusses it in a way that's so uh, well-worded, much more uh, graceful and much more well-worded than I could ever hope to try to discuss in a vi YouTube video of mine, for example. She, she is so so brilliant and so easy to understand so so accessible and the points are so spot on so great so great she speaks about Pisevich she speaks about uh, Ijak uh, there's a great phrase too uh, among uh, all of her points one example being uh, this idea of liberty you know blue uh, liberty the French flag and she says that these ideals uh, are contradictory to human nature in the context of uh, the stories of Pisevich and Kislovsky uh, here blue white and red respectively and that phrase being contradictory to human nature, liberty being contradictory to human nature is so loaded and so, uh, you know, makes one contemplate and ponder. And going back to our discussion a little bit about the inherently contradictory nature of uh, these types of potential interpretations. And that is inherent in the way that Professor Innsdorf is mentioning here. Oh, I love this so much. Um, he, she also speaks about visual differentiation uh, between uh, the films or among the films, again, in the context of a discussion of the trilogy overall. She speaks about the work of Ijak here, the cinematographer, but also she mentioned that there were different cinematographers uh, uh, depending on the film, which gives the film the films its own distinct visual uh, uh, visual uniqueness, and it's also reminiscent too of Kislovsky's work in the uh, in the work the Decalogue, you know, one of the great towering works of uh, of the twentieth century, and uh, here uh, it's it's almost like. Uh, Kislovsky is working in a vein that's very similar to how he worked in the Decalogue. You know, there are different uh, stories, uh, different 
uh, visual approaches as well, and it's very similar to, but there's also a through line uh, th- all the way throughout, and so that type of visual dynamic and also story character construct dynamic uh, that was very evident in a work like the Decalogue is very, very evident here in the three colors, and specifically blue as an example. So, uh, Also, this idea of mourning, uh, mourning the, the loss mourning versus life and living life, um, also, the way in which music and the score and the um, uh, this idea of uh, of music and Preisner and van den Bundemeyer, which we'll talk a little bit about in a separate uh, discussion as well, uh, how this is a pretext to the film, according to Professor Insdorf. Um, uh, she also mentions to this idea of the images, images engendering the action, which I think is a really great way of describing uh, Kieslowski's work. You know, there is a type of philosophical underpinning, but there's always a sense of, of something being the source of that, something in the everyday being the source of that. It's not the psychology that exists first. You know, what came first, the chicken or the egg, right? It's, it's, it, it, the, the question is not the psychology per se, but the question is what is. And, and from there, the question uh, arises, why is it the way it is? So first, what is it? And then why is it the way it is? So I think that is, uh, that, that's a really important sort of order, this idea of image, then engendering action, and then purpose thing to uh, the being then engenders the, the psychology, which I think is also very, very apropos to because we'll talk a little bit about it in other supplements. Uh, there's a great documentary, which we'll talk later about certain questions that are posed to everyday people and uh, you know who they are and what they want to be. And so this idea, too, of the order of the questions in that documentary, uh, starting with what is and then what uh, what results from that is or being. I think is a great thing. Uh, images or uh, existence engendering uh, the psychology or the action uh, and the like. And that's also a very parallel to, to how uh, uh, in some of the other supplements, people like Juliette Benoche talk about working with Kieslowski. You know, uh, they mention how Kieslowski was not concerned with the psychology necessarily, but uh, with the gestures. But that's not to take anything away from, uh, that's not to suggest that Kieslowski wasn't considering the psychology. It was just that in the way that he was engaging with the actors, he was trying to focus on 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 detail and that detail would be a way in which the character could represent the character's psychology or not because it's not always the case that uh, a human being uh, understands themselves right so if a human being doesn't always understand themselves and how can an actor who portrays that human being be expected to understand you know so that type of of real uh, attention to the uh, emotional minutia of the potential of the human uh, perceptions about oneself I think is so profound actually and so that that way that uh, Professor Insdorf mentions it here images engendering the action I think it's so so uh, apropos uh, and the idea of um, uh, other characters and other uh, very famous uh, actors that are um, uh, mentioned here uh, or that are featured here also the the visual cues glass memory object glasses and the reflective glass that's used in a very stylistic way memory sounds that are used that are almost uh, extraordinary to, almost to the extent of being almost ethereal blue the color is used as well there's also a language french language uh, detail now i i studied french a little bit in high school but i don't claim to be fluent at all on the contrary i'm very very not fluent and i don't understand french uh, and i certainly don't understand uh, the french language uh, enough to be able to watch this film without the assistance of say english subtitling so uh, my french is not good so uh, because of that uh, among the many things that professor instorf mentions here one of the great things she says here that's so illuminating is the relationship between olivier and julie there's a type of distance and this distance is uh, can be reflected in the french language in the the words that are used to uh, to th- that mean the word you, y w o u, as in uh, me and you, you. So the word in French is vous, or the word can be tu, and tu has a type of closeness uh, and a f- close affinity, a, f- a type of very casual friendliness. Again, for lack of a better phrase, tu. Whereas vous has a s- almost a, a strong, distant formalness about it, and it's interesting how Professor Innsdorf, according to her 
commentary here mentions that the the use of vous is what exists in the relationship between Olivier and Julie, which again is a very it's also suggestive in a, a linguistic way, the French language sense of distance, which I think was again I didn't know that. So uh, all these details about language, for example, that occur here and occur in other uh, criterion releases, whenever they occur, they are so helpful. So anyway, that's the uh, discussion from Professor Insdorf on blue. Uh, please check it out if you can. Uh, I mentioned it. it's approximately, yes, approximately 20 minutes. And that's not all because we have the next supplement, which is Kislovsky Cinema Lesson. This is described as being from 94. It's approximately seven minutes. And here we have Kislovsky uh, speaking in front of a k- editing deck. And uh, he is talking about a specific scene uh, while giving us the opportunity to speak a little bit about the philosophy uh, that uh, that was behind the making of the film Blue and indeed other films in the trilogy. Uh, here he's talking about a scene involving a sugar cube and a coffee and the way in which the coffee seems to be uh, coloring uh, the sugar cube as it's dipped into the liquid and the timing about this and um, this this is such a great detail because it's an example of the film focusing and almost hyper focusing on a detail that seems utterly utterly mundane on the one sense but the fact of the hyper focus makes something which might otherwise seem utterly mundane, so otherworldly and so filled with potential impact. What is the meaning of this, focusing on this detail, which essentially could be, in any other context, essentially nothing? It's a great thing. It's everything and nothing at the same time. This sugar cube is everything and nothing at the same time. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Kislovsky talks about the timing, the technical aspects of time. He, you know, he had to get it approximately five seconds, no more, no less. So he talks about testing all these various sugar cubes um, and the like. So, uh, oh, this is this is, and also how this reflects the character of Julie, uh, the Juliette Binoche character, in in a way. So it's a character reflection. It's also a, a cinema technical feat, uh, behind the scenes, almost special effect. Uh, and it's focusing on the everyday and mundane, but it's also hyper-focusing on the same time. Oh, so great. So this is an example of uh, Kislovsky's cinema lesson. Uh, it's approximately seven, seven minutes. Uh, it's really wonderful indeed. Uh, and then continuing on, we have a discussion with Juliette Binoche uh, pro- from 2004. Although I think the copyright at the end credits of this indicate 2001, uh, the submenu I think of the Criterion submenu indicates 2004. But in any event, this is Juliette Binoche uh, one-on-one discussion, approximately 24 minutes, and uh, she speaks about her uh, meeting with Kislovsky for the first time, uh, how there was uh, the possibility. It didn't work out in the end, of course, but there was a possibility that she could she could have been on uh, work with Kislovsky on. Um, uh, the double like of, of uh, Veronique, but it didn't happen. Uh, but she had the opportunity to work with Kislovsky again, this time on Blue. She also mentioned, too, that around the same time that she got the offer to work on Blue, she also got the, uh, the offer to work with Steven Spielberg on Jurassic Park. And so uh, she had a choice of whether to work with Kislovsky or whether to work with Spielberg. And she ended up working with uh, Kislovsky. Uh, and uh, of course, it leads to this brilliant, uh, uh, brilliant uh, uh, discussion here. Um, uh, well, not discussion. Well, yes, discussion, but also brilliant tour de force performance. One of the great performances, uh, really. Julia perform- Julia Binoche's performance is outstanding. Now, this this. Uh, Supplement is a discussion with Juliette Binoche. It is also a scene by scene select commentary. So you're getting uh, some scenes where she is uh, discussing uh, aspects of working with Kislowski and the scene itself, or the scenes themselves, totaling 24 minutes. So among the scenes discussed are um, there is a, a scene involving a funeral. Uh, and she mentions to the music that's used and it has a very direct emotional response by her because of the way that the music was used in real life as well as in the film. Um, there's also this idea too of the focus on a, on a feather uh, in one scene, the feather being again another idea of the mundane and the hyper realized at the same time. Um, and also uh, she does mention too during the commentary what she had to do in terms of the clothing and wardrobe choices. Uh, and certain script choices because the script, according to her, was translated from the Polish language into French. Uh, but that also um, allowed for room for her to work with Kislowski. And Kislowski was very open in terms of, of a type of malleability, artistic malleability. 
Um, she does mention uh, how Kislovsky had a type of, uh, you know, there was a way in which maybe there was a technical focus uh, versus maybe a focus of acting from the heart in terms of her, uh, how she describes uh, her method of acting. And this is uh, part of the discussion in terms of a scene, in, a very famous scene involving a reflection in an eyeball. Um, and she also mentions uh, uh, the idea of grief and uh, trying to rely upon works like Annie uh, Dupere. Uh, and uh, he, she mentions too, I think, uh, in not a disparaging way as well, but she mentions how perhaps Kislovsky was not necessarily a quote-unquote actor's director uh, in the sense that uh, maybe f uh, sh he wasn't one to describe, say, the inner workings, the inner psychology of a character to try to help give an uh, actor uh, the actor's motivation, per se, but would try to rely on the actor's own uh, intuitions and uh, 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 research, as well as giving cues in terms of gestures and physical cues, etc., uh, which I think but it, it worked out very well, I think. Uh, and then there's some other... Uh, scenes involved in terms of this uh, scene by scene select like commentary of the pool scene for example um, uh, sh there is a scene too involving uh, her fist and uh, a wall and this is where she talks about there was a kind of heated discussion uh, between her and Kislovsky because uh, she describes how she was she she was vo uh, voluntarily willing to uh, experience a physical harm for the sake of this particular scene because of certain details of preparation that weren't ready at the time that the cameras were ready to roll. Kislovsky, on their hand, according to uh, Vinosh, was very adamant that uh, he wanted to protect her physical well-being at all costs, whereas she, on the other hand, was willing to uh, uh, maybe experience some uh, minor injuries. And so this shows, uh, and she was so passionately... Uh, uh, against uh, Julia Pinos making this choice of, of uh, actually injuring herself or, or, or doing a, a scene that would cause her actual injury. And she does mention that there was an injury that she sustained. So again, it was her own choice to do it, uh, but there was an injury that she sustained you know, throughout the rest of the shooting of the film. So this is an indication of how Kuzlowski, I think, is very caring of uh, the actors and trying, uh, always thinking of their well-being. Um, so... Uh, and uh, also, uh, Binoche talks about the uh, Ijak, the director of photography, on uh, certain choices that were made uh, there, and uh, uh, and other uh, scenes there. Again, I don't want to go into too much detail uh, for the benefit of those who have not yet seen it. But suffice to say that this is uh, really, really remarkable and wonderful. I mean, uh, um, Kislovsky. I mean, Binoche says that Kislovsky is is not necessarily an actor's director, but again, I don't want to suggest that she's saying that in a disparaging way. And in fact, in fact, uh, her comments are actually, and she, I think, acknowledges as well that in fact he is in many ways an actor's director uh, because there's a way in which he's giving the actor uh, space and room uh, to uh, interpret and to grow and to develop the character, including that of Julie by Juliette Binoche. And so for that and other reasons, I think this uh, select scene-by-scene -scene commentary and discussion, this uh, interview in a source with Binoche is uh, really essential. So uh, please check this out if you can. It's really wonderful. And then that's not all, because then we have a discussion from 2011, a one-on-one -on -one interview with Zbigniew Preisner, and this is approximately 21 minutes. Preisner is the composer uh, and worked with uh, Kislovsky on a number of occasions, including Blue. Uh, and here we have uh, how Preisner speaks about how his collaboration with uh, Kislovsky was very different than uh, his collaborations with other uh, filmmaker artists because Kislovsky really allowed uh, or discussed Preisner with Preisner uh, the concepts really early on from almost the uh, the genesis of the film story. And so uh, Preisner became very intimately involved with the story details and beats uh, between him and Pisevich. So, uh, Pisevich, so... Uh, uh, and uh, there was a, a great anecdote, for example, where uh, the, he speaks about uh, working with uh, Kislovsky first on an earlier work called No End. And uh, Preisner mentions how maybe he thought he maybe overstepped his bounds in terms of a, a, an embellishment of a musical bit. And he thought that maybe this was uh, overstepping the point of offending Kislovsky to the point where he would probably not want to work with Preisner again. But on the contrary... Uh, when this was uh, shown to uh, Kislovsky, Kislovsky responded to Preisner by saying, you and I will work together all our lives. 
He was that amazing. And so from then on, there was this great relationship between Preisner and Kislowski in terms of the work on the Decalogue, the double life of Veronique, and then three colors. Uh, also, there's a great moment, too, where uh, there's a sense of the of uh, the music and score because for blue the music is so essential so essential i mean it's essential for all the works but there is a way in which music plays a key role in plot as well as character development as well as the the establishment of the atmosphere so uh, that plays a, a very key uh, role there are other discussions too about uh, the other films a uh, white uh and uh, the idea of the tango and uh, of, of flights of fancy and, and being carefree on the one hand and also read a discussion of that being quote unquote darker more contemporary there's also a discussion of of Vanden uh and uh, who Vanden Bundenmeier is now I don't want to say anything more about that uh, please watch the discussion with Preisner to, to get a sense of who Vanden Bundenmeier is but uh, uh, this is a really great and there's a, also a great quote that Preisner says uh, uh, Kislovsky said to him he said and I paraphrase uh, for the different to be different the different has to be different and so I think that's so so great because it's so suggestive of things being so contradictory at the same time in the world of Kislovsky. Uh, there, people can have many lives. People can have many con conceptions about who they are. Uh, things can and cannot be at the same time. Things uh, have to be different. To be different, uh, for uh, the different to be different, the different has to be different. So, ah, uh, contradiction and paradox all rolled into one. So Kislovsky, so Preisner, really. So uh, this discussion is uh, fantastic. I'm glad it's still here. So please check it out if you haven't already. The discussion with Preisner, uh, which is, again, I mentioned it, but let me say it again, approximately 21 minutes. And that's not all because then we have Reflections on Blue, approximately 17 minutes. Uh, this looks like uh, it's probably from the year 2003, I think, uh, based on how the next supplement in the order is described. But uh, this is a type of uh, making of documentary, kind of, uh, uh, or it's uh, various people interviewed and it's uh, gathered, edited together for purpose of this singular uh, um, supplement again, approximately 17 minutes. So it's with Jeff Andrew, Juliet Benoche, Sarumir uh, Ijak, Annette Insdorf, uh, Jack Vita, the editor, Agnieszka uh, Holland, the filmmaker, etc. Uh, and uh, but maybe a lot of uh, uh, writing time is devoted to the discussions with Ijak and uh, Benoche, uh, respectively, uh, talking about the film Blue, uh, the idea of definition of liberty, the idea of. Uh, of uh, Ijak, the di director of photography, speaking about how the script focused on jogging, but he perhaps suggested to Kislowski the use of the pool and swimming because it was visually arresting. It allowed for the integration of the color blue, etc. And also the pool scenes themselves allow for really fascinating explorations of character gesture uh, on the part of Julie. Uh, and uh, th the idea, too, of of uh, Julie, uh, Julie Binoche's uh, conception of the character, uh, certain scenes are discussed, the lollipop scene, how she uh, uh, takes to a certain piece of candy, for example, how this idea of the gesture, uh, the overt gesture of quote-unquote kindness, is it really an act of kindness or is it really a kind of of uh, almost uh, a gesture, a violent gesture, sort of emotional punch towards the other, uh, etc. There's the idea of the moving camera, editing, uh, the uh, the reflection in the eye scene, etc. So uh, th I think that's another really great comprehensive take on Blue itself. There are some discussion points of the other films in the trilogy, but I think this can be said to be primarily on Blue. So another great one. Uh, please check it out if you can. Again, approximately 17 minutes. And then the supplements continue on with uh, Kislovsky, the early years, and this is with the same, uh, almost the same participants, and it looks like to be the same production uh, flow. Uh, this is approximately 15 minutes, so again, also with Jeff Andrew, Agnieszka Holland, uh, Saramir Ijak, Annette Instorf, uh, and this time also uh, with Irene Jacob, who is uh, the, uh, who plays the main protagonist, uh, uh, Valentin, in the film Red, or Rouge. Uh, this is 15 minutes. This time, this, this is described as being from 2003, which is why I thought, therefore, that the earlier supplement, Reflections on Blue, uh, was also from the same year, 2003. But it's very clearly stated that this supplement, Kislovsky, the early years, is from 2003. And here we have uh, discussions about uh, Kislovsky's biographical life, uh, his childhood, growing up, 
uh, having moved so many times, uh, according to uh, his life story, his biography, when he was young, therefore engendered in him a sense of being curious and, and observing things and people and human nature, which I think is very, very reflective of Kislovsky's cinema. And also the, the choice of wanting to go into cinema uh, filmmaking in the first place, how it was almost like a, uh, it was almost by chance in many, way, in many ways. Um, uh, many things uh, discussed here can be said to be so reflective almost of uh, uh, certain key aspects of uh, his works, especially in the, during the early years. Things happen or may not happen. Blind chance, as it were, perhaps. Uh, but also talking, too, about his work in the very famous, prestigious, prestigious film school in Poland, Lutsch. Uh, trying to apply to film school, not quite getting in immediately, but uh, being persistent, etc. And when he was able to get in, making all these uh, films that were, uh, he's focused on short uh, films or silent films uh, during his uh, school life, and then hit part of his early career focusing too on films, but also documentaries. There was also this idea, uh, the reminder too, about uh, what could and could not be shown in terms of a sort of state applied or state-imposed um, censorship and uh, the idea of the overtly political perhaps not being uh, possible. And so one had to be, if one had to, wanted to make sort of political statements in films, one had to make them as maybe under the radar as possible. And so there are also uh, the way in which that type of filmmaking led itself to uh, uh, en endeavors at political statements as well as endeavors at trying to hide such overtly political statements for the sake of passing the censors. And also that is suggestive too of, of the uh, filmmaking, cinematic nature and craft as well. Um, and the discussion too, is, is Kislovsky therefore a quote-unquote political filmmaker or not? I think that's a very important question to, to that's being posed here as well. So uh, this is uh, great stuff and a great establishment too of the early years of Kislovsky, which we will talk a little bit about in some other parts of the uh, of the set. But in any event, you're getting a great, uh, great foundation here. Kislovsky, the early years, approximately 15 minutes. And that's not all because then the supplements uh, continue with two student films. Uh, we were speaking in the earlier supplement about his early uh, days um, uh, as a filmmaker student or film student at Lutsch. And uh, here we have two films from 1960 or described as being from 1966. The English titles here being given as The Tram. Uh, approximately five minutes. Very interesting story about, or, or story about a, um, a tram, a public transport, and uh, a, a, a young man and a young woman. Uh, approximately five minutes. And there's another film also included, approximately six minutes, called in English here, The Face. And uh, the, the person who appears in the face uh, is a very recognizable face as well, Kislovsky. And so uh, we have this idea of, of uh, type of... Um, uh, maybe engagement with art, shall we say, in the visage, visage excuse me, and the struggle, if you will, of, of art and creation as being one possible aspect of that film. Uh, anyway, we have, again, a, a dis an establishment and discussion of Kislovsky, the artist, uh, during the early years, and embodied and uh, as exemplified and illustrated by, for example, the inclusion of these two films, which is fantastic, absolutely fantastic. So this is part of the Kislovsky journey for anyone who might be interested and included here uh, in these student films. The supplements then are ended with a trailer, one trailer for the film uh, Trois Couleurs Blue or Bleu. So uh, a lot of supplements included here. So again, carried over from the earlier release uh, by Criterion from about 10 years ago or so. Uh, nothing new, nothing added on the occasion of 2023. It would have been nice perhaps to have something new on the occasion of this uh, new re-release of uh, the 4K UHD plus Blu-ray combo edition. But um, I'm, I'm okay uh, this time around because uh, the supplements that we did have from the earlier release that are carried over for this new re-release, the supplements are really great. Uh, I mean this so, so complimentarily. Exhaustive. Exhaustive. Uh, and uh, that's not all because, again, you have the other supplements with the films white and red, respectively, that could be said to be touching on the three colors writ large, including aspects of blue. So we might get other discussions, uh, points on blue uh, in the other supplements. So, uh, to be continued, my dear friends, to be continued. So that's my way, therefore, to say that what we're getting is what we've already gotten, and what we already got was great. So if what we already got was great and we're, st we're getting what we already got, then what we're getting, since it's something that we already got, which is great, is great. So uh, that's my uh, 
two cents on the supplements that are included with blue. And again, the supplements will be found on the Blu-ray disc. Uh, so when you put in the Blu-ray disc, you can go to the supplements submenu. And so I think let's uh, end our conversation here. We will continue our conversations on this set with a discussion of white and then continuing on with red and then some other comments about presentation and packaging, etc. to round out these video discussions. So I hope to see you, my dear friends, at the next video. Uh, but until then, please be happy and healthy and well. And please keep on watching a lot of great, great movies, including Kislovsky works, including this film, Blue. So until the next video, my dear friends, thank you and cheers. Thank you.